Hopla. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Michel. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Ipsos globally. And I want to tell you about an experiment we've been making, a mass experiment we've been making at Ipsos for the past five months. Uh, but before we get into the experiment itself, oops. Okay, I want to talk to you about uh, Roy Amara. U.S. scientist who came up with the Amara law, which I find extremely relevant to generative AI. So it predates generative AI, and it's very relevant for it. We tend to overestimate the impact of a technology in the short term and underestimate its impact on the long run. Very true, I think, for generative AI. You know, we talk about Gen AI all the time, AI, 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 AI. You know, you may have heard Sundar Pichai's from Google. Uh, or Alphabet, talk about uh, AI like 93 times in his speech uh, when he addressed the Google crowds. It's in the news everywhere. It's going to change the world. Has it since November 22? Not yet. So there's a lot of hype. That said, we're living a historic moment, as the numbers show. Um, there's few times in our lives where we'll see such a momentous technology change happening. So Amara, Roy Amara, is right. Now, um, I'm here to tell you again about the experiment and share with you what we've learned in the making. Five months ago, we decided to launch uh, our own generative AI platform at Ipsos called Ipsos Factor. Three goals to it. One, democratize. Put generative AI in the hands of all of our employees, about 20,000 Ipsos employees across the world. Make it part of their daily professional lives and observe. Two, operate applications. Language models are very relevant to the insights industry. We are a language industry. That's what we do. So translations, summarization, codification, transcription, or lots of words that finish with un. Um, applications to work better and faster. And then innovation as well. It doesn't stop at efficiency, and I'll talk to that later in the presentation. Innovation to make our existing products better, thanks to generative AI and language models, and also come up with new products that we couldn't think of before because the technology wasn't ready. Now it may be. So I'll tell you about all that. Ipsos Facto is, uh, again, five months old. Um, we have 44% of the Ipsos population that has already used it. It's about 8,500 8, people, roughly, today. Um, so it's pretty good in terms of adoption. And um, last month, we generated 1, 000, uh, sorry, 150,000 prompts, just shy of that. And it, the number is skyrocketing. It's exponentially growing. Um, I'm here to talk about limitations, what we have observed that are limitations with applying Gen Generative AI at scale in Ipsos in this case, and also about the opportunities that we've seen and that we're very excited about. And I'm going to try to give you a balancing act, right, a balanced view on, on what we've done. That's the way we entered it, and that's why I wanted to start with Roy Amara. It's all about the balance, the excitement and the awareness. So Ipsos Facto is safe and it's agnostic. Those are the two main characteristics today. Safe uh, in that what we put in, in it doesn't go public. Um, agnostic because we started with four models and now we have eight and we're going to 13 uh, end of this week. Um, which means, by the way, in terms of UX, we had to change things because explaining to people what 13 different models do, whoa. It's also about democratization. It's meant for everyone at Ipsos, not just the researchers or the project managers or the people that operate the studies, but also the software developers. There are applications for all populations today. Okay. Um, first limitation we've observed. I told you about our great numbers. 45% of, of the population at Ipsos has already used Ipsos Facto. That's amazing, isn't it? Yes, okay. Um, we're still, though, hitting the current ceiling of adoption. So this is my Sharpie Gate attempt. Uh, you see on, in the background, the curve is a normal uh, technology adoption curve. Start slow, grow, get to the climax and start decaying when the new technology arrives. We're early in the, in, it's early days for Gen AI, of course, right? That being said, um, what we've seen, and you've all read about it, ChatGPT, when it came up, uh, five days to a million active users, two months for one and a million active users, never seen before, unprecedented. We've seen that at Ipsos too, 
right? Same thing. And we, we're measuring, by the way, uh, the ChatGPT usage with our Iris panel in the UK, for instance, and we've seen a plateau. Um, first, because it's not the only act in town, but also because people have started it, but then they don't know what to do with it. So our 44% of our colleagues uh, trying ipsos facto, amazing. We also look at usage and what they do with it, and they don't do enough with it today. Democratization, which is our first goal, is a limitation. People see the potential, but don't know how they can really use it concretely every day. That's the big challenge for us at Ipsos, which is why, by the way, uh, Mathilde, who is in the room with us, is going to be talking to all of the employees in France, and that's happening the same in all countries, to try and up the level and make people ingrained with the technology, make it part of their daily professional lives. That's the first limitation. Things we haven't run into yet at Ipsos, and I'll knock on wood, we haven't had a security breach yet. Although, again, we're using it at scale, and we're pushing adoption of it very strongly. We're also very balanced in, okay, let's make sure we don't have any catastrophic events like the one that Samsung had, you may have read in the news in April. We haven't run into big hallucinations that we have exhibited or exposed to internal stakeholders, let alone our clients. No case yet. It will come, but we haven't had one yet. So no blatant case like that lawyer in the US, which you've probably read about, that uh, essentially pleaded in front of a judge uh, with a body of law that was entirely fabricated and points of jurisprudence that were totally wrong, invented by ChatGPT. Uh, and the judge found out. Oops. The lawyer was a senior lawyer, by the way. I'll talk to uh, novice versus senior. And uh, he had asked ChatGPT, are you sure? And ChatGPT said yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bias. The reign of the white male, says the white male. A bias is a huge issue. ESG is a very important topic for all companies, Ipsos included. We're big on DNI. Um, we haven't had a case yet, and we're extremely worried about this. Going to the average often means huge problems with bias. We talked about it before. We haven't had that yet. So how have we not had those? Because we've applied our evaluation framework around three key concepts, truth, beauty, and justice. We've had that evaluation framework before generative AI, by the way, and we, it's, again, very relevant in this new age. What is it about? Very nice words. We like words. What you've produced with generative AI, are you sure it's accurate? Most of the time, it isn't, at least not on the first go. Ask generative AI, what are the top 10 brands in this market and give me the number of sales units or market share? The answer is likely to be wrong the first time. Don't take it for granted. Can you explain the data? And if you can't, try again. Cross-reference. Are you sure that you can explain the black box and the magic in it is dark magic? Third, ethics, algorithmic fairness and the law. Are you on the right side of ethics and the law when you produce outputs? It's not a given. And the human in the loop. Human intelligence and artificial <coughs> intelligence are meant to work together. That means the human has to be in the loop. Generative AI is like an exoskeleton. It makes you run faster, jump higher, carry more weight. Yet, the human is in the middle. Without the human in the middle, it doesn't work, or it becomes very scary. So, of course, you need a safe and agnostic platform. Otherwise, you're in risks. You absolutely should have an evaluation framework of your own. Do not take it for granted. Um, then we get into the art of the question. We are insight professionals. It's our job to ask the right questions, including the non-obvious ones, of, of course. The art of the question, we're very well geared for that. You need to be able to augment the data that is publicly available with trained data. And that's one of the big next steps of Ipsos Factor, of course, to go into fine tuning, and I'll talk about it in a moment. But for all of that, you need verification and you need activation. You need a human at the start, in the middle, and at the end of the process. You forget that, good luck. So that's how we've avoided the pitfalls so far. So what have we found, though, as limitations? Synthetic data, and there's a, there's a whole section with Annalise in a second. We coordinated, by the way, before. I had to make sure that I wasn't saying, totally stupid. No. We've tested synthetic data. Um, a client came to me recently and asked me, Michelle, luxury client in the automobile sector. 
I struggle with finding people that buy my products or want to buy my products. If I give you 60 people, can you do a, a thousand sample with those 60 using modern techniques and synthetic data? Because I've been approached by startups that promise that sort of thing. And the answer is snake oil. No, you can't. Of course you can't. What are you thinking? Uh, we've been applying weights to data in research forever, right? There are rules to what you can do with weights. Think about it like that. This is making it faster, better, and more powerful. It's the same thing, though. There's no magic. You cannot invent people, or you will invent people that don't exist. And you don't sell to people that don't exist. You sell to real people. We recently had in this, uh, I met him as part of a luxury event we had with 50 luxury clients in Paris three weeks ago. We, we did a very interesting um, test with in-depth interviews. In one of them, uh, we were using Ipsos Factor to recommend products to people and, and we were filming their reaction to it. And uh, the Ipsos Factor recommendations were very precise and spot on, except in one case where we recommended special make of car and the gentleman that we were filming said, no way. Ooh, interesting, why? Well, because I had that model, previous generation, and I almost sued the company, it was terrible, I don't want to hear about the brand anymore. We'd missed it. Why? Because it's not magic. It's all about understanding humans. We refined, because we knew we had a special type of motorbike, and then it recommended something much better. It shows everything I told you before, about not trusting it, not taking it for granted, but using it to go further. So synthetic data is a whole, you know, very interesting concept. It's very good at certain things, you know, profile definitions, people that watch the BBC on mobile in the UK. Can you use synthetic data for that? Absolutely. Multivariate analysis or variance models? Absolutely not. We know of a competitor of ours that got kicked out of one of our largest accounts for using um, lookalike modeling that was totally wrong. Very dangerous. Text analytics evaluation. I'm all for using AI for efficiency. Can we automate or quasi-automate parts of what we do? Well, we've tried. And the short answer is not yet. In English, we are close. But we've tested with non-English and non-Indo-European and we're not close. Using the good old text analytics evaluation frameworks, we're not there, not yet. We can get closer, but you need a lot of human intervention in it because when you go to Thai or Chinese or Mexican or Danish, we took those four plus English, we're far still. So progress needs to be made. Other limitations, fine tuning. So I want to put Ipsos Facto in the hands of all of Ipsos's clients. We're working on it. I want to go beyond safe and agnostic by going training. We have a ton of data at Ipsos, right? We can make models a lot better, a lot smarter, for more relevant, more accurate, richer outputs. That's the vision. And we're limited today. Why? Because fine-tuning sounds like magic, but it isn't. I'll start with the right-hand side. Limited volumes. OpenAI, Google, today, limit what you can do in fine-tuning. You cannot throw a lot of data at it because they're limiting you in terms of tokens and volumes you can ingest. Why? I'll come to that in a second on the left-hand part of the slide. Also, the notion and the idea that it's magic. Just find the data and dump it into the special place that will make it all smart. It's really not true. Uh, there's a ton of upfront work and a lot of metadata to be created because the data wasn't created for ingestion in the first place. So thinking, it's a little bit like big data back in the days, right? Which wasn't, well, which is a thing, sort of, but not really. And this is a thing. But it needs a lot of work up front. So there's no magic. There's just a lot of work. You need people that know and understand data before you can ingest it. Let's go to the left-hand side, which is even more interesting. High dimensional issues. Does that speak to you? Probably not. Talk to your data scientists. Catastrophic forgetting, model decay, diversity collapse. Ooh. <laughs> that doesn't sound too good. <laughs> when you try to throw a lot of data or create real big extensions of models to work in conjunction with the publicly available models that you have to use in a safe space, you get that. We don't know why. We being not Ipsos, right? We don't know why, clearly. Google. OpenAI, on Tropic, they don't know why yet. It's a fascinating space. It's not new, by the way, but it's been exacerbated by generative AI. We don't yet understand why the models that you try to build upon and make smarter 
actually suffer from the intervention that you're doing. Which is why, for all these reasons, fine-tuning today is slow. Much slower than I wish or I thought it would be six months ago. I will show you examples of what we're doing on fine-tuning, by the way. Not nothing, but nowhere near at scale as I hoped we would. All right, my kitty slide. That's why I get a lot of hearts internally when I do that. The lazy researcher. We've created personas in how we've implemented and experimented. Ah, the lazy researcher. A colleague of mine told me, Michelle, that should be great, right? Because if you're lazy, you want to use generative AI. It makes your life so much easier. <clears throat> no, of course not. Um, if you just give a superpower, a, a, an amazing tool to somebody who is lazy, what are you going to get? You're going to get average soup in French. <laughs> You're going to get something that is very random. Something that may be inaccurate too. So putting a superpower in the hands of someone that's lazy is very dangerous. I'll tell you about an example we did that shows the contrary, by the way, but this is a real limitation. All right. <clears throat> Efficiency is a huge reward. We, we're applying it in terms of application to a lot of things we're doing, and we get a lot from it today. Again, not enough people using it. And the challenge is making it more democratized within the company, but we're already seeing very interesting results that are well documented, by the way, by other companies and other sectors too. For admin, admin tasks, desk research, translation, data processing, and everything related to it, questionnaire, interview guides, and queries, it's working. It's working and it's ready. So now let's just use it and be smart about it, applying the framework. For discovering and, and creating, creation of text, image, and video, I'll talk about that uh, in a moment too. Reports and meta-learnings and discovery of insights and you know, the shortening of the time. I'll have an example for you also in a second. I, I, know, I have three minutes to go. So we're very excited. So after talking about the limitations, let me talk about the opportunities. This is a page I stole from something that happened yesterday and the day before in our uh, UU, it's our qualitative service line. So our qualitativists, that's an English term, people that work in qual, um, they were very worried when we started this journey because they thought, ooh, is this going to totally replace what I do? You know, do you need qualitative people? Will Won't you be able to just take what's around and make sense of it with using technology? Oh my God, yes, of course we need qualitative people more than ever because the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence, they have to work together. Think again, the human in the loop. These are just examples, a very small print. You can't read it. It doesn't matter. How are my three statements? Our qualitative team is leading, within Ipsos, the prompt library. There's many people working on it, but they are the leaders of it. Why? Because they are the ones that work the, with language the most. So how are my three statements? To do what? To amp up the good, remove the bad, explore the opposite, question an assumption, go after adjectives, add an, add an unexpected resource, create an analogy, change the status quo, combine concepts, use a provocation. This is just one page from the book about new prompts we're creating to use generative AI, ipsos facto, to make the outcome richer and better. We go beyond. We've created our first product with AI boosted. Uh, ideation workshops to reframe, diverge, and converge, and refine. And we're, we're selling this already. It's the start. I think there's three clients that have started uh, because we just launched it. But we're going to do that now all the time, assuming the client is willing and ready for it. What does that mean? We're embedding Generative AI in the process as an extra superpower that we give to our qualitative researchers to do more and better. Sorry, the slide is small, but the slides will be available. You can have a read. All right, we've also, of course, done this um, concept testing. We've compared three versions using Generative AI to the good old way, the human way, pre-Generative AI, and uh, you find the winner, it's quite obvious, the winner is version C. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure you can read. Version A was the lazy researcher or novice research, right? Just use Generative AI. It produces outputs that are not great, clearly not as good as the pre-Generative AI thing. Then we trained the researcher better. Then we trained the researcher and we provided data into the generative AI conversation to enrich it. That's the winning formula. The human, train the human, add data, bang. Better than what we used to do. We've done that at scale, by the way. We didn't, we didn't do, do it once. Um, it just works. The next frontier is image and video. Image to text and video to text, and Nell talked about it before. That's going to open an a new field for the world of insights 
for Ipsos and everybody else really, we're going to be able to capture a lot more without having to ask people and collect or measure in a passive way. We're going to be able to do that in a, assuming we do it again uh, with people's consent and we don't become big brother. We're going to be able to do a lot more things uh, and that's going to be fascinating. Okay, I'll wrap up because I'm getting over time. I talked about prompt library. We have 120 use cases being worked on at Ipsos today, which is a huge problem for me because we've opened the gates with Ipsos Factor, which is both, again, a safe agnostic platform, but it's also a series of APIs that everybody at Ipsos can tap into and does tap into to create their own thing, where it's like herding cats. You know, that's the beauty of working in a company like that. There's initiatives everywhere. We need to help our clients consume that. So prompt library is great, but what do I do? We have a prompt that is 33 pages long. It's linked to our Sensidium uh, methodology. Super interesting. 33 pages. Oh my God. Um, we need to make it easier for people by having guided prompts. That's what we're doing here. You can see, by the way, that one of them is using Ipsos data, uh, trained Ipsos data, and another one is using an external model, and that's just the beginning. All right, I'll, I'll zoom through the rest. Exploration, that's a real real new product called Signals that we're launching to do exploration based on social, social data. It's in the pet care that follows human care by a few years, trend-wise, again, I am, I have to rush. Um, exploration, then we go into interpretation, having the ingredients, and as you can see before, the, the benefits and the care domains. We make sense of it, um, and then we go into prediction, and in the prediction, I'll call your attention to the column to the right that says Amazon data. We are able to add external data to to check is it a, how, how busy is the space? Is it a white space or is it super crowded? We, we start doing some prediction, early predictions, and then we start creating uh, projects of the future, innovation. This is early innovation. And then, if you like what this is producing, you can go into our innovation service line, which of course is a lot more robust and uh, will take a bit more time. But all that we can do in five days, from start to finish, uh, having the whole thing, innovation spaces to discovery, and that's possible thanks to Generative AI. So speed is crazy when you apply it right. Takeaways, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. Big hand of applause. <laughs>